Good morning, everyone. Glad you could be with us here in the Meridian Church. Uh, there is a few pews open um, that um, we are having in person church. So there are a few pews here um, that you're welcome to come and, and fill. But we're going to spend our time together, most of you online, and we're happy that we can um, do that. Let's bow our heads for a word of uh, prayer before we start. Father, this lesson is so timely. We ask that you would help us to understand the time in which we live and the lessons you would have us to learn from uh, this Sabbath day. We ask you, Father, to bless us as we open your word and study what you would have for us. Help us to learn more about you. In Jesus' name, amen. When your world is falling apart. Wow. Last week, crisis in leadership. Next week, doing things the hard way. <laughs> Unbelievable that these lessons were written three years ago. And over two years ago, they were scheduled for this date, not knowing anything about what was happening, but yet God in His providence has given us these lessons for today. Written three years ago and scheduled over two years ago for this exact date. When your world is falling apart. Does this describe your world today? Falling apart? COVID-19. In California alone, someone dies every six minutes. In the U.S., remember the, the three, the 737 MAX? And they had two crashes, and so they took the airplane out of, out of uh, service for a couple of years? In the United States... It's the equivalent of 10 737 maxes falling out of the sky every day. Every day, 10 airplanes full of people die because of COVID-19. Every day. Hospitals are overloaded. Bodies stacked in semi-trailers. Vaccines in short supply. When your world is falling apart. Politics, division so deep that the Capitol was attacked. Congressmen and Congresswomen are buying bulletproof vests to wear on Capitol Hill. There are over 10,000 <coughs> National Guard surrounding our capital today. Does this describe your world is falling apart? Mistrust of the government and each other is rampant. Even in Boise, what used to be the most friendly place, we moved here because Boise was so friendly. You stand in the grocery line, and before you get to the, the cashier, you'll know the names of the children of the people in front of you. And you'll know about where they worked and what their life is like and all about her hysterectomy. That is what Boise used to be. But today, if you're in a store and somebody's not wearing a mask, and you say something, you fear for your safety. Because we distrust each other. we become so polarized as a nation, so polarized as people, that our world is falling apart. <clears throat> our 
Our economy is in tatters. Our national debt is soaring. Our people are angry, hungry, homeless, and hopeless. This week, this lesson is sandwiched between the second impeachment, the Capitol riots, 10,000 National Guard surrounding the Capitol, the inauguration of a new president. We have this lesson <clears throat> prepared three years ago when your world is falling apart. Isaiah chapter 7 verses 1 and 2 Now it came to pass in the days of Ahaz the son of Jochum and the son of Uriah king of Judah and Rosen king of Syria and Pekam the son of Rala, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to make war against it, but it could not prevail against it. Now I will tell you, I'll make a, a declaration here before we get too far into the lesson. I'm not a biblical scholar. I don't know how to pronounce half the words any more than you do. So give me a little slack if we... Um, if I get the, the names a little wrong or get things a little out of um, out of whack here. Um, so here we have a new king, Ahaz, the grandson of Uriah, the great great grandson of David, and he's now the king, and, and Jerusalem is being besieged. But let's back up 200 years. Let's back up to, the, to King Solomon in that time. 200 years before. We know that uh, during that time, there was a, the Rehoboam, one of the, the kings, made some bad decisions, and 10 of 12 of the tribes of Israel rebelled. And they left. They pulled out of Jerusalem, out of Judah, and went north. And they elected a new king, <clears throat> King Jeroboam. He was the king of the north of Israel, and he took with him ten tribes. It's interesting to me that the only two tribes that stayed in Jerusalem and Judah during that time <clears throat> were the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. Those are the only two tribes that stayed. And the rest of the tribes rebelled against God, rebelled against um, uh, King Solomon and, and that whole reign, the whole story we know about Solomon. And they left and they went up north and started their own kingdom. It's interesting to me that, that the tribe of Levi, the priests, was one of the tribes that left with this group of, of rebellious people. That's just interesting to me. So these ten tribes under Jeroboam turned these ten tribes directly to idolatry. It didn't take very long. They went from being uh, followers of God, the children of Israel, to becoming idolatrous um, people, living in um, wicked ways. So, Ahaz was young, about 20 years old, and he too, well, that's, let me finish. So now we have the, the kingdoms of the north, which is Syria and Israel, and the kingdoms of the south, made up of two tribes. Thank you.
Um, and we have these, these ten tribes in the north and two tribes in the south. And it goes on that way for years. Now let's fast forward to Ahaz. Ahaz comes on the scene as a new king, 20 years old. He has a lot of history. He's a direct descendant of King David. A direct descendant of, of um, Solomon. A direct descendant of Abraham. But yet, he starts making some bad decisions. He starts looking more like Jeroboam than he does King David. If you want to know more about the rule of Ahaz, 2 Kings uh, chapter 16 gives you a whole uh, background on who Ahaz is and all of the, the history of Ahaz. So during that time, soon after he became king, he started looking around at the landscape around him, and he noticed there was a superpower called Assyria. Assyria was a superpower. It was more powerful than any other kingdom um, on, on earth at that point. And, um, and Assyria, like all superpowers, most superpowers, wanted control of the whole world. So they started going out and capturing uh, nation after nation. Well, the kings of the north, Syria and um, Israel, saw what was happening and they knew that they could not stand up against Assyria by themselves. So they thought, if we could just get, if we could just get um, Judah to join us, then we'd have a three-nation coalition against Assyria. So the king of, of Israel picked up his cell phone and called Ahaz and said, Hey, can you join us? Why don't you join us? We'll be a three-nation three coalition to fight against um, these Assyrians. Ahaz says, No. That's not going to happen. So he does not agree um, to, to build this, this coalition. But the two northern kingdoms still knew that they needed more men. <coughs> so they thought that they would go ahead and uh, take over Judah. Install a puppet king that they could control, and then they could use the, the population as soldiers to fight, and they'd still have their three-nation um, coalition. So they got together, these two nations that didn't like each other, by the way. They hated each other. But they got together because there was a bigger threat than, than the two of them were. And they attacked Judah. They started to have some success. They got one city and then another small city. And then they came to the capital city, Jerusalem. But they could not prevail against Jerusalem. So Ahaz had to make a, a, a decision. He made a political decision and he made a um, military decision. You see, Ahaz had, had the lineage, he had the background, he had the knowledge that if he just trusted God, that this would... would See that God would see him through, but he'd already already established himself as anti-God. He'd already um, 
availed himself of the idolatry and the wickedness of other uh, areas. He'd rejected God as his counselor, and he had relied on his own wisdom and his own uh, military might, and he embraced a number of foreign gods. Today, we as Christians abhor, abhor abortion, right? Killing of a baby in a mother's womb. Christians across most denominations agree to that. There's Stanton Help, who is a um, who is a foundation, an organization, even here in Boise. Stanton Health provides free ultrasounds to any woman who is pregnant. You can go into an office, go into a place, and they'll give you a free ultrasound. If you were thinking about having an abortion as a as a as a woman. You can go to one of these clinics and actually see the baby. And they found that when a mother sees this, this baby that has hands and feet and a head and a heartbeat, and they can actually see that it's real, that the, the prevalence of abortions after that go way, way down. Women understand that that's a real baby and not just something they have to get rid of. In Ahaz's world, it was not an abortion. Ahaz had, um, had adopted some of the practices, the heathen, wicked practices of some of the uh, people around him. He was not following God. There's one practice that the Bible talks about in this lesson in which there is a, a god called Molech, the god Molech. And Molech wanted, it's the god of the Moabites. And, and, and the Moabites had said God really wants um, a sacrifice. So they built this iron um, statue to Molech in the valley, just outside of Jerusalem. And they would build a fire underneath this iron statue of Molech until the outstretched arms were red hot. And then they would take their children, their live children, and place those children on the red hot arms of Molech. Imagine the depravity and the hard hearts that you had taken the child, not a child in the womb that you couldn't see, not a child that you could only see a picture of, not a child that you could imagine, but a child you have in your hands that you had fed and nursed and changed their diaper and kissed and cuddled. And uh, the heart, the hardening of the heart that it must have taken and the depravity it must have taken to take those children and put them in the arms of Molech. That's just one example of how far Ahaz had fallen from God. And I could see what was going on. He could see that Ahaz was in trouble. He could see that, that the kingdom of Judah was in trouble. What would happen if the kingdom of Judah fell to the Assyrians? Well, 
you take you take a glass of of um, I don't know chocolate milk. You take a glass of chocolate milk and you pour a gallon of water in one glass of chocolate milk. And then you pour another gallon in and another gallon. Pretty quick, you don't have any chocolate milk, right? The milk's still there. You're still going to have cloudy water. The milk is still there. It's just been so diluted <coughs> that it doesn't even look like what it started out as. That's exactly what happened to the ten, ten tribes that um, were in the northern kingdom. They become so intermarried, so um, fractured, so um, they they taken on the culture of those around them to the point that you could not see a Jewish bloodline in that in those tribes. They were so watered down. If that happened to the tribe of Judah, then Jesus would have not had the Jewish, the pure Jewish blood all the way from um, Abraham through David to Christ through the tribe of Judah. Paul was a pure Jew from the tribe of Benjamin. He'd come through the tribe of Benjamin, and he had a pure Jewish bloodline. If the Assyrians had captured Judah, they would have done the exact same thing. Their method of conquering a nation was to break them up, split them up, and assimilate them into their culture. God's plan of salvation was at risk with Assyria. Was God going to allow Judah to fall? No, He was not. And He did not. So, um, Ahaz had a, a decision to make. How am I going to get out of this? And he decided that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Wise man, right? The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So he called up Tiglish, the king of Assyria, and he said, help me out. I'm your servant. I will serve you. Help me out. And so the king of Assyria said, sure. Came down, wiped out um, Syria, wiped out, uh, took over uh, Israel, and now Ahaz th thought, huh, how easy this was. I didn't even have to fight. You see, Ahaz had looked at that superpower um, Assyria from a distance and said, I want to be like them. I want, I want political power. I want military power. I want wealth. I want people to bow down to me. And so I'm going to be like Tiglath, the king of Assyria. He even found out what kind of altar that Tiglath had in his chapel, in his sanctuary, 
And Ahaz built an altar next to the altar in Jerusalem that was exactly like Tiglath's altar in Assyria and began to make offerings to Tiglath's God. God says, no, 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 no. I'm going to send Isaiah, the prophet. Now, did Ahaz know about Isaiah? Was Isaiah somebody coming from the outside in and unknown to Ahaz? No. He knew who he was. He'd already been established, firmly established, by Uriah, the, the king before him. That's not right. By the king before um, Ahaz as a prophet of God. He'd already established that. There was no question that, that um, he was a prophet sent by God. Yet Ahaz dismissed him. But God said to Isaiah, I want you to go to Ahaz and I want you to, to give him counsel. And I want you to share um, some counsel and, and wisdom with, with him. So he did. And he was dismissed immediately. So... Um, Again, if the Assyrians had captured Judah through a fight, they would have diluted the, the, the bloodlines. And God could not have that happen. Now, Judah was going to be captured, right? If you know your biblical history, Judah was not captured by the Assyrians. God protected Judah. In, in um, I think it's chapter 14, if I remember right. So God says in chapter four, uh, Isaiah chapter 14, verse, starting at verse 24, The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely... As I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand. That I will break the Assyrians in my land. And on my mountains tread him underfoot. Then his yoke shall be removed from them, and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the purpose that is purposed against the whole earth. And this is the hand that stretched out over the nations. For the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who shall annul it? His hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? Turn it back? So God steps in and stops the Assyrians. I love this verse. Chapter 14. 24, surely as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. As I have purposed, so it shall stand. God didn't just have a purpose for Judah. God didn't just have a purpose for Ahaz. God didn't just have a purpose for, for um, Isaiah. God has a purpose for you too. God has purposed something in your life. And God's purpose shall not be dissuaded unless we um, dismiss it. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand. But the Lord of hosts has purposed, and who will annul it? 
his hand is stretched out, and who will turn it back? I'd like to um, take a minute and push the pause button on our lesson. You see, the ten tribes of the north had aligned themselves with the practices, beliefs, and culture of those around them. Are we as Seventh-day Adventists aligning ourselves with the culture and the, the times and the people around us? God sent to Ahaz a prophet to tell him Give him wisdom and courage and strength. And Ahaz rejected the prophet. Today, we as Seventh-day Adventists have prophetic guidance that we've given to us. Are we neglecting that prophetic guidance just like Ahaz did? Is that what we're doing? Last week, I was... I went with Gary and, and Bev to the bank to, um, to sign, to get the head elder's name on the bank account and change it over. And while I was there, I was on a phone call on a video conference all day last Friday, a week ago yesterday, for about eight hours on a video conference call with the General Conference. It was the White Estate Board. The consultation, it's the one big meeting we have every year as the White Estate Board. And all the trustees of the White Estate come to this meeting. Ted Wilson was there, and Jim Nix, and um, head of biblical research was there. People from all over the world were in this video conference. And we had some discussions. And one point that was made that, that really stuck home to me is we as Seventh-day Adventists don't have to defend Ellen White. Our purpose is not to, to hold up Ellen White. That's not, our, that's not what we should do as Seventh-day Adventists. The purpose that we have, the purpose that Ellen White has, was a message for God for us. And we need to uphold the messages that God has, has given to us through Ellen White and not, not hold Ellen White up as some perfect person, some prophetess that's, that's perfect. Ellen White is just a, a vehicle in which God has shared messages with you and I. Messages of hope. Messages to help us to understand where we're headed as a as a world, as a country, and as a Christian nation, as a denomination. And so we too many times, I think, try to say, you gotta learn, you gotta read Ellen White, you gotta do this Ellen White, Ellen White, Ellen White. And even Ted Wilson said, forget who the prophetess was and focus on the messages that she has given us. If you take the the fragile vessel. And I'm not saying that, that Ellen White wasn't a prophetess of God and, and a special person. She was. But the purpose that we have as a church isn't to elevate Ellen White. It's to read the messages that God has for us through Ellen White. So I beseech you, I, 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 we have to, as a denomination, Go back to what God has given us. Just like Ahaz, we can reject the prophet's counsel. And I think too many times we have. We're a peculiar people formed in the image of God and asked to follow His guidance and to give hope to a dark world. Hope for a future. Back to our story. Sorry. Get off my... 
my hobby horse here. If Assyria had conquered Judah, then we would have, we would not be able to have a purebred Jewish Jesus. And the lineage of Christ would have been broken. It's interesting that Jesus and his stepdad, if you will, Joseph, were the only ones who could claim a purebred heritage to the tribe of Judah. God had protected them from the mixing of blood through Assyrian occupation. Again, Paul could claim that he was a pure Jew through the tribe of Benjamin. Judah and Benjamin, only two tribes, uh, preserved at, with a direct link back to Abraham. Judah had to be punished for their apostasy, but God waited about a hundred years, and Judah was then taken over by by who? Who who captured Judah about a hundred years later? Babylon, and the Babylonians had a different way of dealing with captured people, captured nations. They didn't go in and and uh, assimilate them and force their, their idolatry on the nations they captured. They left them alone. They allowed them to have their own culture. They took taxes, but they did not um, force them to interbreed and to do away with their culture so that Judah could then survive. Interesting that the ten tribes from the northern kingdom are now called the lost ten tribes. They no longer exist. You never hear about the other those ten tribes in Scripture again. They're lost. They're so assimilated. They're the they're the weakened chocolate milk, so weak that you can hardly tell there's anything there. Isaiah 14.24 The Lord of hosts has sworn as I have planned so shall it be as I have purposed so shall it stand. God has a purpose for Judah. For Judah. Judah was going to be the lineage of Christ. In the lesson it talks about a son that was to be born as a sign to Ahaz. That son's name was Emmanuel. We know that word, don't we? We know that name. God was saying to Ahaz, I have a plan. I'm going to save this. See, it was in it's interesting because if Ahaz would have just waited... Assyria would have wiped out the ten, the northern tribes anyhow. He wouldn't have to do anything. And then God could have dealt with Assyria in God's way. But yet, Ahaz had to get himself in the middle of it and think that he had a better plan than God did. Ahaz tried to maneuver around God. To use his own devices to get where he thought he should be. But God sent Isaiah to track him down, to give him a chance to choose God over self. God went after him and offered him anything he wanted. God said, Just test me, try me out. You can ask me for anything. It doesn't matter. From the depths of Sheol, to the heights of the heavens. Ask anything of me, and I will give it to you. He could have asked for 10,000 chariots. He could have asked for 
a mountain of gold. He could have asked for, like Solomon did, wisdom. But instead he said, ah, don't worry about it. I got this covered. Keep your gifts. Keep your, your um, offerings. And Isaiah turned him down cold. Is there a lesson in here for us? You know my question. What's my question? So what? So what? We spent the last 45 minutes talking about Isaiah. I mean, about um, Ahaz and, and Isaiah. What are you going to do with that? Did you learn anything? Did... Was there anything that God has presented in this lesson that you can say, I need to do that? Because if we don't do something with what God has provided, if we don't take that and, and, and put it into our lives, then we've wasted this time together. God could have could have chosen many ways to deal with Ahaz. But he pursued him. He says, Ahaz, I love you. I want you to prosper. And he sent, he sent Isaiah to track him down. God is out there tracking you down today. God loves you in the same way. God wants you just like He wanted Ahaz. He wants you to be a new creature. He wants you to, to be that pure line. And we can do that. We can be born again and be that pure lineage back to, to Abraham by accepting Jesus. When your world is falling apart, what do you do about it? How do you deal with a world that's falling apart? The suicide rate is astronomical right now. The suicide rate is, is <coughs> going through the roof. Because people have no hope. We have the hope. Are we sharing that hope? See, that's what we're about. That's what Christ wants us to do. He wants us to share that hope. He wants us to give people hope, to tell them that they're loved and appreciated and things are going to, going to work out. Yes, there's pain and, and all kinds of things coming, but God has a plan. He has a purpose, and He will see that purpose through. Let's bow our heads. Father, we're so thankful that you love us enough that you track us down where we are, that you send your prophets, that you send us to speak to those in need. May we today be agents of hope. May we today, in a world that's falling apart, be a beacon of light for those around us. But Father, we know that we must have that relationship with You to do that. Give us the will and the purpose to follow You. In Jesus' name, Amen.